My name is Dr. Timothy Ball, and I have a PhD in climatology from the uh, Queenberry College at the University of London, England. My experience uh, of having chaired commissions of inquiry for government or being on, on commissions of inquiry with government is that commissions of inquiry with government are that there are certain things that politicians love. Commissions of inquiry are one of them. Uh, deficits are another because with a deficit they can say, oh, sorry, we can't afford that, but then if they want to do something suddenly, magically, the amount of money is there. Um, with a, if, if there's a problem or a conflict that develops and it's causing a lot of difficulty for the politicians, they can say, oh, we will appoint a commission of inquiry. It'll be independent. And uh, that takes the heat off the issue. Well, yeah, the government's reacting. They're finally appointed a commission of inquiry. And then if they don't, of course, they say, oh, you're afraid to put one on. You know, you're hiding something. So, okay, we appoint the commission of inquiry. Um, but then what people don't realize is they control the outcome of that commission of inquiry. Now, first of all, they've got the advantage now because if the media come and say, well, what's going on? What? Can't talk about it. Commission of Inquiry. Wait till their report comes out. Well, that delays usually two, three, four years, by which time all the political heat's off. But more important is they control it by the terms of reference. And the example I like to use is the Warren Commission Inquiry into Kennedy's assassination. And Judge Warren was asked about something after. He said, well, why didn't you look? Oh, it wasn't in my terms of reference. He'd been limited by those that wrote the terms of reference. And that was my experience. One of the first cases I was asked to look at, and the minister said, uh, I, gave, I said, he said, would you look at this? And I said, sure. And then I get the terms of reference. And I said, I can't work with that. I can't provide you with a proper answer, a complete answer with those terms of reference. So of course, then the minister said, well, sorry, that's what you got to work with. And I said, fine, then I'm not doing the job. And I'll go to the media and say, you're trying to limit the investigation here. So I could one-up him. Uh, with that. And so when they set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Morris Strong, who we, we should talk a lot about, um, he wrote the terms of reference. And uh, the first term of reference was the definition of climate change. And he limited it deliberately to only human causes of climate change. And uh, of course that effectively eliminated all the natural causes, natural variability, which is why you see them not looking at things like the sun uh, and, and a whole bunch of other, other issues. And um, of course, he then limited it even further in uh, another term of reference that you, he, he set it up into three working groups. There was the technical group, working group one, which was, wrote the science report. And that was 600 of the 2,500 people. The other 1,900 were in working groups two and three. Now, they were inconsequential because they had to accept the findings of working group one, which were already limited by their terms of reference. So whatever their finding was, working group two and three then said, okay, you're you telling us it's going to warm. We accept that as fact. We now look at the implications of that. And that's where you hear all these stories about, oh, the, melt, the, the ice is going to melt, the sea level is going to melt. So really, the majority of the report by 1900 scientists is accepting without question the finding of the first group. Now, strong, it really restricted it even more because they then, well, they, they came out and said, look, the, this report is not to be used for policy. But then they set up the summary for policymakers, the absolute contradiction of that. <clears throat> and the summary for policymakers is written by a, a, a completely separate group. And then they write it independent of the science report. The science report's finished and set aside. The summary for policymakers is written and, and given out to the media. So, for example, the last report, our, uh, the uh, fourth assessment report, came out in 2007. The summary for policymakers was released in April. The science report wasn't released till November. But the rules, the terms of reference that Strong wrote said that the summary for policymakers goes back to the science report people 
and says, make sure your science report agrees with what we've put in the summary. So it's like a, a, an executive of a company writing the summary of a report and then telling the employees to find the facts to agree with the summary. And it's the most unbelievable process you can imagine. So it's in those terms of reference through the IPCC that not only have you effectively eliminated most of the major causes of climate change, the natural variability. And of course, if you think about it, unless you know how much natural variability there is, how much natural climate change there is, and what are the fundamental causes of that, you can't possibly identify that fractional part that may be due to humans. But that's, that's precisely what they're doing. And uh, so um, that's, that's uh, why uh, things appear so illogical and why so much is left out of, of the um, IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, which have become the authority. A very interesting take on the matter and one that goes, I think, to the heart of the issue and how these types of frauds are perpetrated on the public and how they can be sustained even in the face of supposedly well-educated and great thinkers like those in the climate science and science community generally, who we one would think would be the first to call out the type of scientific fraud that is being perpetrated with these documents. But this goes to show, again, that if you can shape the scope and the, the nature of the investigation itself, then you can determine its outcome beforehand. And that's a very important principle that we will discuss in more detail in an upcoming episode of this report on a completely different matter, but again, it's the same principle that applies over and over in these phony investigations. And people who are interested more in the setting up of the IPCC and its history would be strongly, I would strongly recommend that you look into the history of Morris Strong, who has absolutely nothing to do with science, in fact was a junior high school dropout who uh, happened to uh, to catch the eye of a younger David Rockefeller who took him under his wing and helped him steer uh, the UN along towards the creation of the IPCC and the Rio summit in 1992 and many other things besides a very unlikely multimillionaire um, who emerged uh, basically to try to to further this this agenda through the United Nations fascinating character and someone that we've uh, we've at least touched upon we've we've talked about him for example explicit, explicitly in episode 87 of this podcast the UN doesn't love you so I will refer listeners back to that for more information on Morris Strong and the foundation of the IPCC. But I think if there's anything we can take out of today's episode of the podcast, it is that we need to brace ourselves for the upcoming propaganda blitz that is about to hit us regarding this fifth assessment report. And the fact that the only thing that the mass majority of the mainstream media will report, of course, is that the IPCC is only further bolstering its previous assessments and in fact going even further than ever before in predicting just how dire the consequences of carbon dioxide and basic human industrial activity are going to be for the future of the planet. So we have to gird ourselves against that by arming ourselves with knowledge. The best place to go for knowledge on these matters is places like, for example, judithcurry.com, which I cited earlier. Climateaudit.org is an invaluable resource. What's up with that.com absolutely a exceptionally important resource for uh, keeping up to date with what's happening. And I would like to humbly suggest that people also support myself as I start a new video series talking about different aspects of the global warming fraud, because once you start to look into it, there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of little points that come and make appearances on the climate science stage and then go away before anyone has a chance to really dissect them. There are so many of those that are really need to be dissected. So I'm going to be starting a new uh, global warming series coming up in the coming few days where I'm going to release one specifically on this issue of the IPCC's fifth assessment report. So I will ask your support in helping to spread word and knowledge about those videos and that video when it appears in in particular, as we can really make a difference as, for example, the alternative media spearheading of the Climate Gate scandal shows, we can break through to, to the mainstream masses who only get their news from the BBC and other biased institutions like that.